and welcome to A Piece of String, the show that brings together comedians and scientific minds to ask, and maybe answer, the biggest of all questions ever. I'm Matthew Shribman, I'm a chemist, and some might say a biophysicist, and with me today are Josie Peters, an astrophysicist. Hello. Paul Stumbly, a laser physicist. Hello. And James Hay, an epidemiologist. Hello there. Each of us will ask a question to which one of us secretly knows the answer, and points will be allocated on a tyrant arbitrary basis by our producer, Sam Lee. The winner will get this shriveled garden pea that I'm holding, which came from this um, package, which said on the side, expertly selected for freshness and quality. But this one was not expertly selected, and that is the prize. What's so, to win this week? Wait, what? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just... Casting shade on your price. Oh, is really? Okay, I shall eat it now. <laughs> it but it's, it's still available as a prize. <laughs> <laughs> there it, there it, you'll, you'll get it a bit later. The remnants are available. Um, Paul, what's your question for us today? All right, Matthew. What would a chimpanzee call its dog? So there's that chimpanzee that owned a cat, right? Or maybe several chimpanzees owned cats. Was it a chimpanzee? It was a gorilla. It was a gorilla, yeah. yeah. Coco. Coco the gorilla. Oh, yes. And she could do sign language. And we had that thing in another episode about how she was trying to blame her cat for when she (laughs) ripped the sink (laughs) off the wall. (laughs) What's the biggest dog you guys have ever spent time with? Uh, The biggest isn't like the biggest name or the the most famous dog. exactly what I was meaning. Like most famous (laughs) dog. (laughs) Canis Majoris, the star. Little dog called uh, Scooby-Doo. You've hung out with Scoobs? Yeah. Was nice Shaggy guy. there as well? Shaggy wasn't there. No, they don't hang out. They're not, they're not friends. Just pro- yeah, colleagues. Yeah, uh, professional friends. Set, mate. That is sad. Have you guys seen the Caucasian mountain dog? Tell Caucasian. me more. Caucasian? Yeah, absolutely enormous dogs. When you look them up online, they're like almost as big as, as like a, a full-on human being human. Um, it's ginormous. You can like ride on top of them. Wow. Like, they look a little bit like gorillas, but you with take a them cute to dog face. Of course, of course you can take them to work if there's a good dog policy. Yeah, forget your roller skates and your scooter. Take the dog. Oh, you mean literally take the dog to <laughs> yeah. transport? Yeah, maybe. You can sit on it, might as well. It's, it's not really chimpanzees, but it's funny that humans have dogs as pets, isn't it? I think, I think probably everybody's heard of this like dog domestication idea before. Tell me what. It's a good trade-off, yeah. isn't there? Like, right? Yeah, so, so basically like the theory is that like when, I think, I think it's when humans start, like during the agricultural revolution... Or, no, I think even before then, like humans and dogs have started co-evolving together because there's such a benefit to, to the other species of like being mutualistic. So there's a benefit to dogs in terms of like, I think it was during, I can't remember which period of time it was, but it was during like ice ages, for example, when the amount of prey available goes down. So dogs have to resort to scavenging. So there's, it's better for them to kind of follow human hunter-gatherer packs around and just scavenge off their food. But then it's also beneficial to humans because... Um, dogs are good guards, hunt. right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, they're, they're good. They're good for things like um, providing extra security. So, you know, obviously we have like guard dogs, and that's a genuine thing. Where like dogs in packs, you know, some of them are kind of vigilant against predators. So it's kind of handy to have like these other like watchdogs about. Um, and so I, th- I think they think this happened like, well, I think it's competing hypotheses, but one of the, that it dog domestication started around six, thirty thousand years ago and i think it's in like china i think thirty six thousand is the longest that we think that's exactly. as long as we've got evidence some evidence for but disputed yeah. yeah so it's disputed i think one's yeah about like thirty thousand years and one the other's like sixteen thousand years um but what's really interesting is that the metabolism and digestive systems of dogs and humans in those kind of uh, dozen thousand years they've changed or they've evolved in a similar way so you can use like antidepressants for humans that actually like work as antidepressants for dogs. So a lot of things that work for humans work for dogs just because our like metabolisms evolved uh, mm. coincidentally. That's incredible. Or you can use your dog as an antidepressant, can't you? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So the you're talking about the do- domestication of dogs during prehistory for humans. Um, so it's been seen recently that in the last several thousand to ten thousand years that uh, chimpanzees have entered the stone age and the reason we know this is because rather than many uh, many uh, species of monkey use stone tools um, but what they will do is if they need a stone tool they will just find one lying around and and use it to break open nuts or to um, do whatever they need to do with the tool 
what must be done exactly do what needs to be done uh whereas uh the one of the properties of, of of entering the stone age is that instead of just finding whatever tool is lying around if you find one that's particularly good at the job you will then carry it around with you um, and use it the next time until you find a better tool and then you'll substitute it so you start hoarding your preferred tools yeah. which happened in humans um and it started happening in uh, chimpanzees and for context, some of the other things that humans did during the Stone Age were domesticate dogs and master fire. So if left uh, untampered with by humans, various species of monkeys would, in the next several thousand years, start domesticating other animals and creating fire and start cooking and all of the uh, evolutionary processes that came along with humans um, starting to cook and enter the Stone Age. So, so these Maybe. chimpanzee, Stone Age chimpanzees, mm. so are they passing on their kind of um, tool craft knowledge like down generations within the same troop? Yeah, so I think that it, I think that humans, uh, when it happened in humans, they entered the Stone Age at very different points around the world. So chimpanzees will be doing the same thing where certain troops know about these things yeah. and, and other troops won't. Um, but they get so much interference from humans at the moment that it's probably a very, a very uh, biased process. Because there's, there's like a really famous um, zoologist called Jane Goodall. I think most people oh, have heard yes. of her. Yeah, and she did a lot of work with chimpanzees. And I think there, I can't remember which country, African country it was, but there's two troops, troops of chimpanzees and they both use stone tools, but they use different stone tools. One uses stones to like crack open nuts to get the insides out. And the other uses like, I think uses twigs to like pry insects from like tree bark and stuff. But the But it's interesting because those two troops, because they obviously develop separately they pass this knowledge on between generations but neither neither troop knows the other troops technology so so there's you know explaining what you're saying about like different troops kind of developing things independently is the technology patented between the two different troops can they defend their ip when you start getting to like advanced stone age you start creating your own patents yeah (laughs) so has anyone anyone got a full-on answer for this so I've, I've tried to answer this, but, you know, shy of asking a chimpanzee, mm. it's, you know, it's very speculative. Um, I mean, speaking of which, so I thought, okay, firstly, are there any chimpanzees or great apes that have pets? And we've talked about um, Coco. And I think Coco is the only domestic gorilla we know that has, or we kind of, we've anthropomorphized her a little bit, but we say she had uh, five pet cats, one called All Ball one called Lipstick, one called Smokey, one called Miss Black, and one called Miss Grey. Lipstick's and, such a good name. Yeah, <laughs> and apparently Lipstick was called Lipstick because I had a really cute uh, pink nose and mouth. Um, but for me, I wasn't, I'm not entirely convinced because they claim that the gorilla named these um, animals, but not convinced that the uh, gorilla had the kind of mental wherewithal to do that. But there is evidence... Well, people have also speculated that there are uh, troops of... Um, apes in the wild that have pets so there's a really famous um example in hamadryas baboons in saudi arabia and you might have seen this video of like these baboons uh stealing puppies of wild nearby wild dog populations and trying to raise them as their own and then and then you see these like um troops of uh, baboons like hanging out on the mountainside and these dogs just also like grow now adult dogs just hanging out with them and they like play together and they hunt together and stuff um but I'm not, again, not convinced this is actually like, you know, technically a pet because these baboons also do this kind of juvenile kidnapping behavior with like rival baboon tribes. And it's mm. kind of like a, almost like a sign of um, like kind of uh, preemptively uh, avoiding aggression. Yeah. So we think it, you know, it could just be using that behavior but on a different species. So it's not really pet keeping. There's some other really interesting um, mutualistic relationships between um, wolves and gelada monkeys. So Ethiopian wolves, which are solitary. Um, they're found hanging around with the uh, gelada monkeys, which is in uh, obviously in Ethiopia, and they have a like three times better success rate of catching rodents when they're near the monkeys than they do on their own. So these like monkeys and uh, wolves kind of like tolerate each other, so they live mutualistically. So this kind of like human or like I guess uh, ape dog kind of mutualism is like prevalent in the animal kingdom. Okay, so. That leads us to believe that, okay, maybe, you know, we can see like chimpanzees having like some kind of affection or some sort of needs to reference their, their dogs. Um, so you think, well, what, how might a monkey or chimpanzee refer to a dog? So that kind of leads to the, leads to the question of um, language in non-human primates. Okay, and this is like a really big field. And again, it's a lot of speculation. It's a lot of kind of uh, controversial science. So 
there's the most famous kind of chimpanzee language experiment is a chimpanzee called Washu. And basically this was a chimpanzee that they raised in the 60s. And the kind of weird, it was, it was kind, of, kind of a creepy experiment. Because what they did was they raised Washu as if Washu were like a human baby. Yeah. So they mm-hmm. like clothed her and like they gave her like a trailer with a fridge and like a bed and a sofa and stuff. So it was a little bit creepy. Um, but the idea was that they were trying to teach her sign language and she learned 350 different uh, signing words. Yeah. Um, then there's the other famous example is uh, Nim Chimpsky. Have you heard of Nim Chimpsky? So he, this is obviously a pun on uh, Noam Chomsky. Um, and they did. They tried to replicate the experiment with Washu by teaching uh, Nim some sign words. So yeah. Nim learned about 125 uh, signs. So we have evidence that you know that chimpanzees can learn some sort of language in captivity. But what about in the Because those languages, they just learn like the words for things, right? They're so not, this this is like grammar. the why it's a bit controversial. Is is it that they kind of they're really understanding how to use language? Are they forming their own sentences and questions, or are they forming associations between like either signs or sounds and concepts? Yeah. yeah so yeah. there's like there's this famous horse called Clever Hands, Clever who was basically Hands. they they. Uh, I don't know if you've talked about Clever Hands before, but no. they Clever Hands was like kind of a really famous like circus act where Clever Hands was a horse who could apparently do maths. Yeah. And they figured out, actually, well, Clever Hands isn't doing maths. And Clever Hands is just reacting to the audience. So when Clever Hands kind of like approach the right answer on a board, all the audience go, <gasps> so Clever Hands knew when he was approaching the, the right answer. So this is kind of the idea that, you know, we anthropomorphize animals as having more of an understanding of something than they do. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's a bit of a non-committal answer about uh, chimpanzees having language, but they do have uh, some sort of communication systems in the wild. So chimpanzees use gestures rather than uh, vocalizations to communicate to each other. So chimpanzees in Uganda have 66 different gestures wow. that correspond to different concepts. So things like stop that, contact, initiate grooming with me, uh, can I climb on top of you, that sort of stuff. All the important ones. All the important ones, yeah. I mean, the stuff that you use Where day to day. <laughs> I don't speak English. <laughs> What's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my thought was, well they probably have a gesture for like predator. So there's these like vervet monkeys, for example, that they have different vocalizations for whether it's a land predator or a a threat in the sky. So for leopards or eagles. So I think my answer to your question is going to be whatever gesture chimpanzees use to indicate presence of a predator, of a land predator nearby. But I don't know what that gesture is. Interesting. Well, that might be the name they'd use for a dog. Yeah, that's, that's what I think they would call a dog, yeah. It would be some, basically, I think it would be something very descriptive. So like Coco calling the cat like lipstick, it's basically, if they have a gesture for like a concept they can observe, they would probably use that to describe the dog. Yeah. Mm. Very like nice. Like spot the dog. No. How's it like spot the dog? Uh, surely that's a dog with a spot on it, isn't it? Ah. Mm, then, yeah. then, then, then yes. My dog looks like Ringo Starr. Yeah. Ringo. So what would the <laughs> chimpanzee call its dog? <laughs> with the gesture. Which obviously we can't show, but that is the that is the answer. Mm. Thanks for that gesture, James. No problem, Matthew. All good. Um, I've got a question. If I only ever exercised one finger and nothing else, could I still stay healthy? Do you mean that like you still walk around, but like the only thing that would lift up a dumbbell would be your finger? Okay, that, that could be the case, but let's say that I just literally sit still all of the time, but I move my finger. So, okay, I will do some basic communication when needs, when needs must, but uh, on the most part, I'll do everything just with one finger. I'm going to stick with a one-fingered limb out here and say no. <laughs> but I do have a thought about how you could only move one finger and still stay healthy. Okay. Oh. So modern-day prosthetics can be controlled by other muscles in the body by connecting them to the nerves in muscles that still work. So if you had a prosthetic finger that was connected to different muscles in the body, you could be still just moving one finger, but exercising whichever muscle the connection was to. Ah, so we'd basically be rewiring my body so that I still have to exercise. <laughs> yeah, so yes. Like, I can't really get out of this one, I don't think. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, for the record, I actually quite like exercise, but, but still... Um, Might also involve quite a lot of surgery, which you know, I'm up for it. <laughs> so are you, are you saying rewire the, like the nerves rather than like? Because I'm thinking like a puppet master who only uses one finger to control all of their puppets. Like mm-hmm. if you like have those strings, like a complex series of pulleys, 
connected to your finger, could you move all of your limbs? And like by just like manually moving all your muscles, does that do the same thing as actually like choosing to move your muscles, if that makes sense? Ah. Yeah, if you can only move your finger, can you chomp your teeth? Can I want my teeth? <laughs> chomp them together chomp. Well, whilst you eat. Masticate. Ah, I can do a bit of chompy chomp. Well, it depends <laughs> if I've been rewired nervously, but otherwise, no, I'll, I'll do as much eating as I can with the one finger. So if someone puts uh, like a, a cheese Cheeto, what are they mm -hmm. called, on my finger, then I'll Cheeto. have a go at like oh. flipping it up into my mouth, which I'll leave dissolve. open for convenience and hope it dissolves in there. Yeah. So it's a diet of soup and Cheetos for for you in the future. <laughs> yeah, although the soup is hard to get from my finger to the mouth, so that that requires. Can you can service. you swallow though? So when you say you can only move your finger, does that include all of the muscles like kind of embedded in your body, like yeah, all your yeah, your various sphincters? They're, they're just off. Yeah, oh. I think we're forgetting the lungs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then, maybe the heart, and heart. <laughs> the brain. Okay. okay, let's change this to Josie's one. I'll do all <laughs> the normal things, um, but but in terms of going to the gym, if if you were to go to the gym or go for a run, you just cancel all of that and you just. Maybe just do a bit of weightlifting with your finger. Mm. Mm. So the premise of your question is by just burning loads of calories with your finger. Yeah. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Enough? You'd probably get, wouldn't you get quite a sore joint on that one finger? Mm. Or just a really strong joint. I'll be so used to it, won't it? What if well, the... Well, because they say, what is it? Isn't it if you're like people who are gymnasts and things like that who put loads of pressure and weight on their joints and stuff from an early age, don't they tend to develop arthritis yeah. and stuff earlier than other people? Thing. What if every? What if what if the the finger in question was uh, pressing the button to a series of ab trainers, those electric uh, impulse machines oh, that were so they were so popular in the nineties? So they? they always looked so good on the adverts, yeah. but they were probably absolute you can nightmare. force force muscles into becoming healthy just by using one finger to press the on button. Mm, it sounds like more effort than it's worth. That. <laughs> <laughs> so something I was wondering was, um, you know, like Rafael Nadal. The tennis player has got an absolutely massive left arm mm. because his left arm is much stronger because he's, he uses it for his, his tennis playing. Ooh, left mm. um, To what extent, if you exercise one muscle, does that result in the growth of other muscles in your body? Because like, someone told me something, which I was wondering if might come up today, about, um, about using muscles, like using your finger muscle uh, muscles over and over again, um, if that might release growth factors into your bloodstream that would result in your other muscles staying healthier than if you were just completely stationary. Mm. Now, to the listeners, you won't be able to see, but the people in the room can see, I'm obviously quite a gym buff. <laughs> uh, I know that people who exercise, don't exercise their legs, get slower growth in the rest of their body because their leg muscles are so large that exercising them releases these um, growth factors in greater numbers than exercising upper body muscles do. And so exercising your legs will boost your upper body growth more than just upper body exercise. Oh, Does it really like that digestion so sense. as well, maybe? Like if your body is kind of like, oh, crap, I need loads of protein to build muscle, your body will produce maybe more enzymes to break down protein. And therefore, like you, you'll extract protein and build muscle easier just overall because you're extracting the, uh, the building blocks more efficiently. Maybe. Maybe, James. Why don't we find that for sure? <laughs> oh, it's some cold hard facts here, James, isn't it? <laughs> All right, let's think about it this way. Why not try and replace the recommended exercise for the day with What's that? Um, like a, a 30 minute jog, something jog. like that? Jogger. 30 minute of uh, increased heart rate. Try and replace that with just finger exercise finger exercise okay so how much can a, a, fi a finger lift if if is the only thing you've been lifting for years with be pretty strong right i think it probably would be i'd say i could probably lift with my finger approximately the same as i can bench press 10 kilos a cold, a cold <laughs> 10 <laughs> yep, a cold he 10. did say gym buff and uh, he wasn't lying um, paul has massive fingers by the way they're each 12 inches long <laughs> okay so if you lift if you lift this weight repeatedly over and over again 10 kilos with your finger up mm -hmm. and down um, you can do it. For, you can do it for half a day. How how often do you have to do it in order to get the same amount of exercise as a jog? Paul, run the numbers. Well, we can work out. Uh, let's say the the energy that would be required to lift ten kilos, uh, ten centimeters or so, like a a, a very large tw twelve inch finger rep. <laughs> uh, it would be about uh, something like a thousandth of a calorie. Could someone else do that? I'd have a li I have a lisp. A thousandth <laughs> calorie. <laughs> That's right. Uh, divide uh, a 30 minute jogs about a Kit Kat, isn't it? About 100, 100 calories. 
So that would mean something like uh, something like fifty fifty thousand reps a day. Who's, awesome. who's good with the number of seconds in a day? Sounds doable, that. So that'd be like um, a rep every second for half a day. Yeah, and then the rest of the time to uh, have a finger Relax ice bath and then and then sleep. Sweet. I like how a negative Kit Kat is now our unit of healthiness. I feel like <laughs> yeah. Nestle is going to sue us. <laughs> uh, um, City Mapper, am I allowed to say brands? Yeah. Logist- logistic uh, directional algorithms. No. City Mapper or Google Maps now offer directions for walking yeah. in terms of uh, burning of everyday treats. Really? So they can say, don't take the tube, don't take a bus, you'll burn off a donut. Just, just for personal like, you know, benefits, does like, clicking computer mouse count as a finger exercise? How much force do you reckon yeah. I exert with one click? You could, have so, it, you could start building in resistance training from your yeah, mouse. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I bought a new mouse recently and it's got weights in it and it weighs like, like 25 grams or something. But mm. you can add more or less weights to make, like, you know, provide more resistance. So I'm thinking, right, I think I can probably stay healthy just by playing computer games if I get like, a really high resistance clicking mouse. So we think that's like... Or, like that's the future, Tenth isn't of a it? gram. So times your answer by, oh, yeah. what, like 10,000? Yeah, yeah. I think I can do it. Nice. So just, just the old 140 hours a day. Yeah, yeah, just classic, yeah. 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 <laughs> now, does anyone have an answer to my question? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, it's me. What I took um, as exercising one finger was essentially to be like, this is a kind of a fancy way of saying not exercising at all. Maybe. Mm. Um, and looked up sort of, so first of all, like what is healthy, uh, which is deemed as being in both good physical and mental condition. Um, some of my initial Googles and searches came up with a lot of links of upset people who have podgy fingers who really want to lose weight on their fingers, which was not related, but I found quite funny. Um, As a finger exerciser, I've got some good tips on that stuff. There we go. That's for another, for another time. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, so if say if you were exercising before, it takes two weeks for a lot of your fitness that you've built up to decline and to fade away. So your muscle strength and your stamina and your flexibility will all begin to fade after just two weeks of not exercising the rest of your body. Um, And with like sort of having reduced blood blood flow and things like that, you will start to get worse sleep as well. You'll start to feel less alert because there's less sort of blood flowing around, especially to your brain too. Um, Men, you want to be exercising because if you don't, you may have some sexual dysfunction. Um, So... Keep up with the exercise if you want to please your partners. Um, Once you start, so there's also this um, thing, sorry, I can't remember the the name of it, but there's this effect where once you start to do like one active healthy thing in your life, it encourages others. So if you're an active person, you will already want to, and you'll also need more nutrients, but you'll crave more healthy food. Whereas if you become more lazy, you will crave more unhealthy food. And that will sort of also start to make your metabolism will slow down. You get out of breath more easily. Um, your bones will get weaker. So by doing resistance training with weights, that actually helps to strengthen um, bones, especially good for women pre-menopause to make sure that your bones don't get brittle as you get older, ladies. So that was the physical part. But mind as well, if you stop doing much exercise, you will begin to get grumpy and depressed um, because exercise is linked to releasing like serotonin and dopamine and all that stuff that makes us feel nice and happy but will also be worse at dealing with stress which is something that I didn't necessarily know about I thought like oh yeah I know that like you know exercise can definitely boost your your mood um but apparently exercise is anti-inflammatory and reduces oxidative stress which is when there's an imbalance between reactive oxygen species and your body's ap- ability to repair the damage against those like oxygen molecules that there were like more specific names but that was kind of like the general name for the group of it which i thought was quite interesting and that's all like linked to anxiety and stuff like that so it does have this big mental effect on this uh oxidative stress stuff oh Jesse, yes did you um did you watch my little video about breakfast that i did no nope <laughs> Still Jersey, still not watching your videos, videos, Matt. <laughs> That's about oxidative stress. Is it? Yeah. Well, folks, if you'd like to know more, head to Matt's channel. I'm <laughs> sure you can find out more about oxidative stress. But for now, if you only exercise your little finger, it's not good news. And now for the mystery midsection. Just before we started the show, I gave everyone the following question. What is a Morkin? 
I then asked everyone to write down a fictional but reasonable sounding answer. I will now read out all of those answers with the real answer mixed in. Everyone will then get the chance to decide which answer they think is correct. What is a Morkin? Is it 1. A traditional Celtic bag worn with a kilt 2. An anatomical model with all of the upper layers of skin removed for study of the subcutaneous layer of fat and the termini of the lymphatic system 3. A Mormon who is also a dork Mormon plus dork equals Morkin 4. An animal that has died by some means other than its own intentions. 5. A pubic wig traditionally worn by prostitutes to obscure their genitalia. 6. A small cellular pouch in the stomachs of marsupial rodents that allows the slow release of stored food matter. You have six. Six? Dang darn tootin' what now? Who, who was the mystery extra? I Why, think. hello! <laughs> <laughs> oh, if it ain't old Jim over here. Uh, I fed in two fakes for fun. Go. Discuss. Just just to profess, this round is not a void if you've had two answers. So any points you win, Matthew, you don't get to keep. No, well, it's because one yeah, of the fake yeah. answers, everybody already knows is a fake answer because before we did the show, it was already revealed. And I was so proud of my fake answer that I put it in anyway, even though everybody knows that it's fake. So I, I like the idea of that an animal that intends to die and then does not die <laughs> by its intentions. <laughs> All the other animals go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to drown. Yeah, I'm going to get caught by a tiger and ooh, I'm going to fall out this tree. And then someone else gets swooped in by a bird and like, oh... Yeah, Ted, what a Morkin. I know this yeah. is against the spirit of the round, but yeah. I, I wrote the Mormon answer what? and also know that it's true. Ooh, wow. But they can't both be true. Words in the English language always laughing? have exclusively one meaning. There's an unusual game theory here. <laughs> Plot twist for you. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> so, so uh, anyone going to get a good so answer? Uh, answer two was possibly just a description of my worst nightmare. What was answer two? A f- sort of fatty, skinless, humanoid model. Uh, the anatomical model, mm. yeah. Hey, come on, mate, I'm sitting right here. Jokes? <laughs> <laughs> we I mean, laughed we... more at the awkwardness than the actual joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, ooh, so what do we have? We had, what was the bag? Oh, yeah, Scottish bag. bag. Mannequin. Mormon dork. Died, I mean, died of other means. Like, I mean, that's obviously rubbish, right? Because no animals other than humans deliberately die as far as i'm aware and i know a lot about animals i'm gonna throw in a little uh, factoid and say lemmings purposefully throw themselves off cliffs that's not I'm true pretty, yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not true. yeah <laughs> mm. oh wait what's this what was the sixth one? Oh, the pubic wig no the pouch for food number five the is the pubic wig. Pouch. oh yeah Ooh. um i reckon oh, that's really tough I reckon it's Mormon Dork. I reckon, I reckon that you are trying to play us. Mm. I believe you. Okay, yeah, Mormon Dork. No, no, wait, no, that's wrong. No. Okay, I'm going to go with Mannequin. I'm g- oh, no, I'm not going to go for Kilt Bag because that's not true because I know what the real one is. Um, or does she? Pouch for food. Marsupial pouch. Marsupials. Paul? Yeah, my chips are going on, on a uh, pouch for food. Marsupial pouch. Well, today we have two winners. <gasps> Josie. Hey. No, I'm Josie. the Mormon one. No, no, JC didn't win anything. No, I don't win anything. Oh. James, take I mean. it away so fast. Yeah, it's a marsupial pouch. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and uh, oh no, James just wins overall. James wins. Um, what was the, right one? the one about the anatomical model was my second fake answer. Oh. That sounded too complicated for it to be true. I know, it's because I panicked because, yeah, before the show, we, uh, we revealed that it wasn't the pubic wig because that is, in fact, a merkin, which was my original fake answer. So what is the real answer? The real answer is an animal that has died by some means other than its own intentions. What? what? That that is is animals have intentions us, to die? Give us an example, Matthew. So, yeah, I thought this was quite strange. Um, and so I, so I looked into it a little bit and I found a few examples. So, for, so uh, e.g., a termite 
um, mm. defending its nest might uh, rupture some of its glands to make itself uh, sticky yeah. in self-defense. They're uh, killing itself in the process. It's called autothi- autothysis. Um, and other the attacking animals will stick to it and won't be able to attack the nest. But Isn't that in the movie Ants? I'm pretty sure that happens in the movie Ants. It might do. I think they, yeah, they self-destruct when the ants go to attack the termites because obviously ants and termites are eternal enemies. And they get all sticky. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Let's go rewatch it now. Eternal we'll be back in an hour. <laughs> um, but then there's also examples of um, uh, like ducks suffocating themselves after, their, after the death of a mate. And there are other birds oh. who... It's quite often because, you know, birds have such strong breeding pairs that sometimes when the mate dies, uh, birds have been known to fly up to a very high altitude, close their wings and crash down to the oh, ground. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah, dogs refusing food after the death of an owner. And there was, there's even um, evidence that animals like deer, when being hunted by um, packs of wolves, for example, uh, will jump off cliffs to avoid the grisly death of being eaten by the wolves. Wow, they would rather just oh, crash. Um, so do, do you think, those, do you those think, are obviously not Morkins. No. Do you think bees know when they sting someone that it's their last act? Or would they count? Would that not? Would they I feel count? Like that's Morgan? day one of B school, right? Mm. <laughs> Again, another movie for that. What's, <laughs> yeah. what's the movie? B, B there movie. There is a B movie. Do they, Ma- do they is get that? Is there something thing? for all bugs? I mean, you're missing a crow movie. That's what we want. Oh, that's it? what we need. Uh, Josie, have you got a question for us? Yes, I do. How long should the working week be? How long is the working week? Roughly 35 to 40 hours, depending on who you work for. There's an EU directive, isn't there, that you can't work more than 40 hours a week unless you like sign away your rights. So like people who work in like investment banking and like consultancy, they have to sign this thing where they're like, I will work, I, you know, waive my legal rights to not work longer than this. Sadly, ah, it's yes. quite, uh, seems quite common for anyone who works in a city, yeah. in, a, in a nine to five job, so to speak, that they have to sign that away. Yeah, I, I put that in the contract that you guys all signed. Exactly. What? <laughs> we're, yeah. d- we're up to 38 hours already for this recording. So. <laughs> yep. Isn't there some like weird technicality as well that if you ch- choose, I'm doing inverted commas, to work on the weekends, then like it's not like overtime and there's all silly loopholes like that? Uh, I think that depends on the company. But yeah, some companies won't pay people anything overtime for working on weekends. Mm. To get your job done as such. How long did the working week used to be? Every day of your life, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know, Quite pretty right. long. Like what? Quite right. 84 hours? Those 12, were the days, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it should be. People well, these days. Yeah. And then six weeks? Six days? <laughs> six weeks a week. That yeah. was They were the hard six days weeks. when you're working <laughs> six <laughs> weeks every week. Back in my day. Why is the week that seven days long again? Because it's quite interesting that we have like five days on, two days off. Luna? Who found this balance? Is it? Oh, no. Well, it used to be six days on God's Day off. Yeah. And then we went to five when the Industrial Revolution meant that we didn't have to work six days a week. Did we? To, to have the same production as an as output as a country. Oh, wow. So you moved to five. Uh, and presumably with increased automation, we will eventually reduce the amount we have to work. Mm. But it's, Well, it, that was, that's been the dream for so long, though. That mm. Everyone's dream. been saying that, oh, you know, there's all this automation, all this machinery, la, 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 la. In the future, no one will have to work at all. But mm. it's just not happened, like... It's even the same with housewives, right? They used to be like, oh, well, instead of taking an entire day to do your washing, you can do the hoovering, the washing and the dishes because you've got all these machines. So whereas before they envisaged that all these housewives would have actually sat back and relaxed while their washing machine was going, they just end up doing more stuff. And it's the same with like the work life too. Um, oh, sorry, Paul. There's also a stalemate in companies because if some companies started offering a four-day working week, then they would, it would be a disproportionate benefit. So it would, it would break the system essentially. So there's, a, there's a forces at work to keep it. Keep what the do you mean by a disproportionate benefit? If people were offering the same salary to work for four days a week instead of five and they, the business thought that they could uh, be as productive then uh, they would have a disproportionate advantage in hiring new candidates. Isn't that, isn't that fine, though? Like, fine surely that's that. what we all want. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of why don't they, they, they would then be paying their uh, workforce more relatively mm. than the competitors, which that you could equivalently get the same by giving everyone a 20% raise, and companies mm. don't really do that on average. You'd be probably more productive, though, if you were chilled out enough to have a three-day weekend. 
So you'd probably actually get. So but what's it? There's this new like Scandinavian Scandinavian system, isn't there? Where um you work six hour days, so you do like a three hour slot, have a break for lunch, three hour slot, and go home. Yeah, and um, social media is completely banned. Like you can't. Yeah, get it's like yeah you, you have, have to be like to actually yeah. really paying attention. But you can go home at sort of three p.m. Wasn't wouldn't that be lovely? You have more time to yourself. Lovely. Happier, happier work. Didn't, didn't, people. Wasn't there a company in Scandinavia that tr- like trialed a four day work week as well? Or am I just thinking of what you just described? Could be similar. I think they tried trialed a four day work week, but I think it was kind of. I think they just gave up on it. They did it as like a, we'll do a trial run. Everyone was really happy. All the employees had a great time. They're like, okay, trial's over. Let's just go back to a oh. normal uh, five-day work week. That's if crazy. only someone had researched an answer. Well, somebody has. We will soon find out. Well. Um, but I was thinking of something quite interesting. For, for you that well, it's not that interesting. But uh, when James, uh, not, not current James, but other podcast James, James, James Wells, Wells. Um, uh, and I went to Norway uh, a few years ago, we we were kind of we were trying to drive to a glacier because we wanted to climb over a glacier, but basically the snow was so bad and our preparations were so bad that we just ended up in this random farm in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. And loads of us were like, "Yeah, let's definitely go and see how this farm works." And we met the farmer, and the farmer insisted on bringing us and these other group of guys into the farm. And inside the dairy farm, the cows. Um, when they wanted to be milked, just like walked into a special milking compartment and then a laser guided udder seeker <laughs> would find the udders and then like slip the thing on and then, and then milk them. And so they, they just, they just chose to be milked whenever they wanted to. And the farmers just had to sit back and just make sure everything was still working. Hmm. Um, and it was so efficient that it meant that like three different farmers could all earn their keep from this one farm all doing barely oh. any work compared to um, what you might expect. And the conditions for the cows were really, really nice mm. as well. I guess that's the thing as well, isn't it? It's that, like how long your working week should be depends on what your work is as well, right? If you're someone who chops down wood, you probably do need to generally work a longer week than someone who s- thinks of theorems and sits down with a But pen then and at the same time, yeah, it's more tiring work, like the amount of calorie expenditure. Well, the, well mental exhaustion too, though. I guess you've got two ends yeah. of the spectrum. Does anyone know where the concept of an eight-hour working day, a 40-hour week, came from? Nope. So I recently visited Melbourne in uh, Australia, I believe. Australia, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they have a monument in the centre of uh, of Melbourne that has the figures 888 on the top in gold. And as an interested party, I asked about it. And it turns out that in the late 1800s, Stonemasons used to work every hour, uh, every hour of the week, and they decided this wasn't for them. So they got together and they decided that we should have eight hours work, eight hours recreation, and eight hours sleep every day. And so they went on strike, uh, and eventually uh, they st- struck, striked, stroke, so hard, struked with an umlaut. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they. Their strike was successful, and uh, every stonemason in the area was allowed this eight-eight-eight lifestyle, where they worked eight hours, had eight hours recreation, and had eight hours sleep. Uh, and it and it stemmed from there. That's where the wow. sort of the arbitrary eight hours sleep must come from, then, because it's like because <clears throat> before the invention of electric light, people would often sleep very differently. You might have a sleep in a four-hour chunk, wake up, maybe like say hello to your friend and have a sandwich. Hey. There's a cheeky wink there. And then uh, go back for another four hour kip and wait until the sun rose again. But with the, with the dawn of electric light, there's this myth of the idea that you would sleep in a big eight hour chunk. I mean, some of us do, um, but churches. it's not na- the natural way. The churches used to give out pamphlets for people to read during those so-called waking hours to avoid them getting up to any other business. Ah. Oh, la la. Good old churches. Nice they old pamphlet, keep you company. <laughs> they were several years too early for the electric light <laughs> and so no one could read them <laughs> <laughs> so i think like the cultural history of, wor- of the idea of a working day for humans is quite interesting i don't know if like anyone's read the book sapiens but i think like loads of people have. keep but, needing to yeah it's, it's, it is i'm like part way through it it is really good um but they talk about at this, um the move from being a hunter-gatherer society to a um agriculture-based society is basically when we started working like crazy <laughs> because when you're in a hunter-gatherer society you have like these big payoffs when you maybe like succeed in a hunt or you find like a patch of berries or whatever so you get all your calories then 
and then the rest of the time you just you just chill out or you just maybe do some weaving or just you know service your stone tools bit of weaving but when we started becoming reliable on like grains and grasses and stuff um obviously like there's they're actually really crappy plants to um cultivate because they require a lot of attention and a lot of resource so basically the more like we relied on these plants the more we had to invest all of our time and energy in looking after them and then it creates a bit of a kind of um the luxury trap yes the, exactly the luxury trap so you like start um cultivating more plants so you can like grow your tribe size or grow your civilization but because you've done that then you need to create more food and then it, there's a kind of a runaway thing going on here where the more you rely on the plant the more you need to work it so we basically became like slaves to these plants right so we used to not really have to worry about it but now obviously we have to work like crazy i will now reveal the answer that i prepared to this question <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, tell us. Are you ready? I'm going to enforce it at work when I find out. It's a bit difficult to get, get all the information because a lot of this is just to do with uh, like people's perceptions or what they think is reasonable. But I did find some, some figures. Uh, so there's this study done on Italian CEOs, which was criticised very, very heavily on the basis that these CEOs were working a lot less than a lot of other CEOs. Um, but uh, which I won't comment on. Um, but uh, there was this study that showed that for every 1% more time that these CEOs spent at work, it equated to about two extra percentage points of increase in the profitability of a firm. So I guess it's kind of useful to have people around for longer if they're important, but at the same time, I'm really skeptical about that whole thing. So I just thought I'd say it. So I had some numbers. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean... It, when, when you're asking like how long should the working week week be it really depends as well on what kind of job you have like if, if your job is is very much just a, a job to make money in order to enable you to then have your own leisure time then the ideal working week is just as short as it can possibly be whilst you get the things done that you need to be competitive whereas if you're doing something that you love and you're trying to make something then work kind of starts to overlap a little bit with recreation and then and then the ideal working week could be really really long you could be spending almost all your time doing it just because you you love doing it and it brings you all the things that you like in life um sorry this is quite this is actually quite wishy-washy and i'm going to try and wrap it up with some good stuff um but yeah so uh something i found uh was um this study done by sage consulting um who said that 40 hours to them seems ideal again it's based on quite arbitrary things but but they were trying to do um actual statistics on on genuine productivity and they showed things like if you increase 40 hours a week up to like 65 hours a week then you might be doing 24 more hours of work um but then you're only getting about 10 more hours of productivity um at the rate that you were getting at your original 40 hours of work so in that sense it's kind of you're getting these like diminishing returns yeah. Um, How long would they would that be a trial as well? That they'd be like, oh, work these sixty hour weeks, or those people that regularly work sixty. Yes, exactly. This is like over a long period of time. So the oh, idea wow. is, if you work sixty five hour weeks for a very short period of time, then yes, you are a lot more productive. Um, but but this, the idea is that this decreases, um, and so eventually, after like an eight week period, the people who were just consistently working forty hour weeks will end up with a higher level of productivity. Um, so some people conclude from this that, yeah, you're getting diminishing returns, so you might as well work less in order to have the maximum efficiency. Um, but then it's kind of complicated, isn't it? Because if you're in a super competitive environment, you may be getting increasingly inefficient as you're working longer and longer hours, but also that it might give you that tiny edge that gets you above, uh, gets you beyond someone else who you're competing against. And so we still really have a culture that forces people to work very, very long hours um but yeah it, the idea of this diminishing returns thing is that if you work crazy long hours then you are more likely to miss um opportunities um because you're, you're so stressed that you're not really noticing them or you're not doing enough communication um and you're not making as good like high level decisions um and so you may be doing extra work but maybe you're not directing your work into the right places and you may make more mistakes so there's there, there really isn't a good answer for this in terms of how long is the optimum number of hours per week um and the main thing that uh but the, the only statistic that really stuck with me as being like yes that that looks like a really good indicator of the direction we should be thinking about is germany so germany as we know is like one of the most productive countries in the world and the average number of hours worked per week in germany unlike um 
you know, America and Japan where this number gets up to like 40, 50 and so on. Um, in Germany, it's 26 Wonderful. hours per week, wow. which is very, very small. And so a lot of the evidence tends to point in the direction that if on average we worked fewer hours per week, we may actually be more productive if we're doing it in the right way. And we have arrived at the end. Points have been allocated by our producer, Sam Lee, according to a system that none of us understands. Sam, what's the verdict? Well, supplied as you all were with miniature dumbbells at the start of this recording session, I've been monitoring how many reps each of you has managed to do with your index finger by way of stress relief. Um, And I can report that, unfortunately, Matthew, um, uh, you only managed (coughs) three. Josie, oh, was a rough ride. Josie got a um, a, a very solid ten thousand in, yes. and it was nearly a tie between Paul and James with fifty six thousand each, oh. um, until um, Paul went to get some cupcakes from the door. So uh, James just snuck an extra few in in the last minute. So uh, congratulations, James, on your victory this week, Thanks and your James. thank you everyone for the effort and your enormous uh, muscular index finger. Thanks, James. For now, thanks to Josie Peters. Thank you. Paul Stubbley. You're welcome. James Hay. Cheers. Matthew Shribman, that's me, our producer, Sam Lee, and to Unbound for their generosity in hosting and supporting us. You can follow us on social media by searching A Piece of String or String Podcast. If you would like to find out more about astronomy and astrophysics, you can follow me personally on Twitter and YouTube at Josie A. Peters. And if you'd like to learn about many and various scientific curiosities from a man in a bath or otherwise located, you can follow me on social media by searching Science in the Bath or Matthew Shribman. If you have a quirky question of your own that you'd like a scientific answer for, then please reach out to us on any of our social media channels. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review us on Spotify and iTunes and Stitcher and so on. It makes a really big difference in spreading the word. Uh, We'll be back again in a fortnight. And as usual, let's never speak of any of this ever again. Thank <laughs> you.